if everyone could start to make their way to the uh, program and find a seat. We're going to be starting in just a few moments. We have people waiting for us on Zoom. So this is a, a, a virtual event as well. So we need to uh, get started. So please uh, come and find a seat. Uh, grab some wine, grab some cheese, and find a seat. Thank you so much. Once again, if everyone could start to make their way towards the seating area and find a, a seat, we are going to be starting the program. We do have people waiting for us on Zoom, so we, we'd like to get started. Natalie, can you, can you please start inviting people to take a seat? Thank you.
Check one, two. Check one, two. We're good? Hey, hey, check. There it is. All right. Good evening, everybody. Ready to play ball, huh? What could be better? JCC and baseball and Team Israel and the World Baseball Classic. A lot of exciting things here. So uh, my name is Paul Frischman, and I'm honored to be the Chief Executive, Executive Officer of the Galbert Family Miami Beach JCC on the Simpkins Family Campus. Got everything in there. Check. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And I welcome you here today, and we are really excited. I mean, we, this JCC, when you came in, hopefully you saw we uh, are celebrating our 10 years in this building. Whoops. 10 years in the building. And uh, we're very proud of the incredible programming and the re outreach that we have an impact within the community. We serve about 6,000 total individuals here on Miami Beach. Pretty impressive out of a 35,000 square foot building. Yes, thank you. So we're really proud of the impact that we make, and it's because of partnerships and programs like this. Last night, we actually had a comedian, we were just talking about this, Rita Rudner was here on the very same stage, and so we're shifting from comedy to baseball tonight, and uh, baseball is near and dear to my heart, and I'm sure to many of yours. So we have a lot of people here in the room, and many, many people joining us online on Zoom, so we're looking forward to a wonderful conversation. Hi, Mom. Yeah, there you go. Thank you for being here. Any, anytime, just jump right. And you got the Marlins jersey on, too. My parents are watching. Right All right. Yes. Hello to everybody. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, acknowledge a few people. Again, I mentioned this as a partnership program of our JCC. Where's Robin Jacobs? Did they move her? Robin, stand up. Please stand, Robin, stand up. Everybody knows Robin. She wears a lot of different hats. And the hat that she's wearing tonight is really the convener of a lot of different groups. But Robin, for those of you who don't know, was a former chairperson of this very same JCC. We looked a little different back then, um, and we're very proud of Robin's involvement uh, and her family's involvement here at the center. Uh, I also want to thank Natalie Brody. Where's Natalie? Our adult and cultural arts director, along with Karen Sepsenwald, Mauricio, who's behind the scenes making everything happen. Thank you, our CEO, Michael Tobin. I believe is on his way. He may not be in the room just yet. Also joining us tonight, may not be here yet, but will be here, is Commissioner Alex Fernandez. So please put, a, put your hands together for him. And also I know Commissioner Steve Miner and family. I know his wife was here. Steve's on his way. And his wife Sharon, and I believe his children, Michal and Matis Yahoo, are joining us. Correct? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, when you came in, for those of you who didn't, I hope you received a raffle ticket because we are doing a raffle, a free raffle, for five tickets to Sunday's game, Team Israel against Nicaragua. I think I said that correctly. Team Israel, Nicaragua. And that game is at like 12.15. So we will be doing that raffle in just a little bit. Uh, I think I got everything covered here. Uh, it's now my pleasure to tell you a little bit about the partnership that brings us together tonight. And I get to introduce... Ami Eden, here's Ami, the CEO of 70 Faces Media and also the executive editor. Did I get that correct? Very good. And also, I was told can dunk or did dunk a basketball at one point in his life. No longer can. Oh, okay. Roll the tape. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Ami played the lead role in bringing together the merger of JTA and My Jewish Learning, culminating in the creation of what is now 70 Faces Media. Prior to that merger, he served as the CEO and editor-in-chief of JTA. Uh, before that, he was the executive director of The Forward and the editor of its website. He also worked as an editor of the Jewish Exponent in his hometown of Philly. Philly boy. 70 Faces Media is the largest and most diverse Jewish media organization in North America. Today, they operate several digital brands, including JTA, uh, My Jewish Learning, Juniverse, Alma, the Nasher and Kfeller, and an international syndicated service as well. Uh, it was founded in 1917. The Jewish Telegraphic Agency, also JTA, uh, has reports on development impacting Jews around the world. My Jewish Learning, Inc. was created in 2002 to leverage the internet and other new media to spread knowledge uh, of the Jewish religion, history, values, tradition, and culture in a manner that's meaningful and accessible to all people. The brands collectively serve as our virtual town square, highlighting and hosting multitude of voices and conversations. They inform people about Jewish news, history, traditions, values, entertainment, and culture, 
And with that, I'm going to introduce a Jewish boy who can dunk the basketball at some point in his life. Here he is, Ami Eden. I really quickly want to echo uh, Paul, and I want to echo the thanks for, um, for Karen and for Natalie, and especially a big thank you for Rob and Jacobs for your generosity of time, spirit, energy, and everything else. Um, also, want to thank our own, want to thank our own Theo Weasel here, um, who really makes all of our events happen. Want to say thank you to Norman Lipoff, who's here. He's a former president of ours. Um, the most important people in the room. And we'll get to Jacob in a second, but Jacob Kerfus's parents are here. So thank you all of you for being here. Thank you for everybody who is who is here online. Um, I'll just quickly echo, you know, we are a multi-brand media company called 70 Faces Media. Uh, we take great pride in um, operating at least five or six different brands, really dedicated to the idea of, of reaching as many members of the Jewish community as possible and doing that by hitting all of their different interests. And I'll just say, um, it's, it's been a lot of work to, to, to build this. And what's driven me the entire time was, can we get this company big enough where nobody on my staff or my board would be able to stop me from finally launching a Jewish sports product? And, the first, I've always wanted to do this, but we needed the right person. Jacob Gervis joined our staff as a, a, a social media person, but quickly expressed interest in this idea, much to the chagrin of many of my colleagues, but uh, very joyful to me. And he's really taken the Jewish Sport Report, which is our weekly Jewish sport product, and made it happen. Um, and, you know, with his, and reporting now, He'll be covering the World Baseball Classic in Team Israel. So if you haven't signed it up, if you haven't signed up for our brand yet, be sure to, and most importantly, sign up for the Jewish Sport Report. And I will hand it over to Jacob. Okay. Thank you, Ami. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's so great to see everyone here in person and those of you on Zoom. Um, Thank you again for the introduction. I'm Jacob. I write our Jewish Sport Report, and I'm really excited about uh, this group of people on the stage with me. So from your left, we have Scott Rogowski, the original host of HQ Trivia and the anchor of many different shows about trivia and sports. Um, Meredith Shiner, a veteran reporter, communications expert, and the writer and host of the podcast, The Franchise, Jew Sports in America. We have Jeff Passan, the senior MLB insider at ESPN. Mitch Glasser, the former, a former player for Team Israel and a former Chicago Cubs Chicago White Sox prospect, Jonathan DeMarte, former pitcher for Team Israel and former Chicago Cubs prospect. Did I get that right? Okay, great. So thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to start at the beginning, and I want to hear all of you when you fell in love with baseball. And don't worry about years. I'll start so that I can date myself as the youngest on the stage. For me, it was 2004 and the Boston Red Sox in the playoffs. So now you don't have to worry about that. When did you fall in love with baseball? I mean, I do have to worry about it, but not for that reason. I broke the ice. I broke the ice. It's okay. You can, whatever, whatever year you say is okay. All right. I'm I the thought, old man on stage I thought here, we were actually. getting tall mood. <laughs> what he said in the beginning. Uh, 1986, Municipal Stadium in Cleveland, Ohio. The Indians just suck. They are so bad. Year after year, there are 2,000 people at the stadium every game. Father takes me to a game, and there's this light-hitting infielder named Tommy Hinzo. And me being five years old and not knowing any better, I scream at Tommy Hinzo, hit a home run, Tommy! And what does Tommy Hinzo do? Hits one of, I believe, his two career home runs. <laughs> Baseball is the most romantic sport, and as a child, you, like, you don't understand that, but you feel something about it. And the fact that baseball these days with the pitch clock is starting to resemble that baseball of the 1980s I grew up with, uh, making me fall in love all over again. We're going in order of old, Follow that oldest. up, son. Uh, yeah, no, I don't have, I can't say I have a moment like that, a Tommy Hinzo moment, but I do have a Timmy Tuffle moment. Because I, uh, I guess I hit my, my baseball fandom around 89. And it really came, I mean, my parents, my dad, a huge baseball fan, went to the very first Yankees uh, fantasy camp in 1984. My mom was pregnant with me at this fantasy camp, and he got Mickey Mailer to write a letter to my mom saying, thanks for letting Marty play. That's pretty cool. 
And I, he wanted to hear that story tonight. So, you know, my, my dad had the baseball card collection. And he was big into it. And I probably got my first pack of cards before I even understood what baseball was, really. But it was collecting those cards, 89 tops, and then getting the books about the cards, and then going to the ballpark. I mean, those early Mets and Yankees teams grew up in New York. Having a Bud Harrelson managed uh, Mets team and a Stump Merrill managed Yankees team. Those were the nadir for a New York sports there. But uh, I fell in love with it during that weird time. And then I got the 96 Yankees World Series. But then I became a Mets fan. It's a whole thing. We don't need to get into that. Um, I don't know that I'm older than you, but I'm just going to go for it anyway because I'm going to like... <laughs> I'm going to like save the argument between you two on who's older. Uh, for me, I think it was probably the early to mid-90s Chicago White Sox. Um, it's interesting. I feel really grateful to my dad. And a lot of the show that I did focuses on sports as heritage and tradition and what we pass on to others. My dad was a huge, huge sports fan. He's also a huge Cubs fan. Uh, and I emerged as a White Sox fan. Um, Partially because my mom was an art teacher and she aesthetically liked black and white better and she did not like blue and red, which is a very weird reason to become a fan of a team. But Frank Thomas was just this generational talent. And even though I was six, like watching someone like that play baseball was incredible. I also like was the only person who was obsessed with Robin Ventura. Like it didn't matter to me that he got punched in the face. Like I really, I really enjoyed how he played baseball. And so, like, the last thing was that I think it was easier then to take kids to a White Sox game than a Cubs game. Like, a Cubs game in the early 90s was no place for a child. Uh, so I just really loved baseball, and I loved being contrarian growing up north of the city and being a White Sox fan. And so all of those things really converged, and it gave me, like, a language to talk with all of the other kids in school, too. I could talk about baseball. I could talk about the Chicago Bulls. And it just all took off from there. That's actually pretty amazing because Meredith and I just met today. And we were both from Chicago. And I could probably just say that same exact story. My mom's side, uh, White Sox fans. Dad's side, Cubs fans. And so I had to make a decision at a young age. And luckily, my parents got divorced when I was really young. So, uh, And I was living with my mom, so I was a White Sox fan. Um, but uh, I, I, th I think what my, what my parents would say is I came out of the womb and I would just had a bat and a ball and a glove everywhere I went. So I have pictures of me growing up and I had this red bat that I carried with me everywhere. So I was obsessed from a young age going to games uh, and, and just watching on TV and reenacting what I saw on TV every single moment, moment running around the living room. Uh, I, I was obsessed. And uh, so I don't think there was a moment. It was just it was in my blood. Well, I was hoping to say that uh, Mitch, you're up before me, but I'll save myself for last. Um, so, grew up outside of New York City, uh, Northern Westchester, and have been a Yankee fan my whole life. So, my earliest baseball memory was actually July 8th, I think, 1990, either July 8th, July 5th, 1998, and it was David Cohn's perfect game. So, that was. What yeah. was it like growing up knowing nothing but baseball joy? Like, how did that feel? We're, we're getting there. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so all of the Yankee-Red Sox rivalries, like we were talking about before, um, amazing times at Yankee Stadium growing up. And actually, my brother grew up a Cubs fan, diehard Sammy Sosa fan. So for me, after, you know, after playing in college, you start playing professionally, and you kind of lose that fandom. Um, when I signed with the Chicago Cubs, that was you know, the most f full circle moment for me. Um, big dream come true for my brother as well. And now that I'm no longer playing, I've become the obnoxious Yankee fan again. So <laughs> we're back, yes. Maybe, but you are one of the only Yankee fans I've met who agree that Yankees fans are worse than Red Sox fans. So, I did say uh, this. common ground. I'm a hard disagree on that. I feel, like, <laughs> I feel like Yankees fans accept that they are fans of the Yankees and that they are obnoxious, whereas the Red Sox fans still act like they exist in a time pre-2004. And to me, that makes them worse fans. You weren't asking for my opinion, but I decided to share it. I'm yeah. not saying anything. <laughs> yeah, because you all got in trouble. I love those stories, and we got so many great cities here represented and cities with great Jewish communities. So let's, let's talk Jews and baseball. It is the title of our event, after all. So, American Jews have a long and well-documented love of baseball. And I want to know, for you all, in your careers and as Jewish baseball fans, like, why? What is so Jewish about baseball? I've talked about this with some of you. Um, but I love this question because there is no right answer. It's a Jewish question. Exactly. 
do you want to start, Meredith, since you... You've yeah. you've discovered <laughs> you've okay, discussed well, this question on a podcast. Yeah, so so. Uh, in my podcast, the franchise, I really explore the intersections of Jewish identity and sports culture, and the whole series starts with Sandy Koufax because he's iconic. He's like Talmudic. Like if you grow up Jewish in America, he is one of the central figures of your life because you're going to high holiday services and you know you want to go to the movies with your friend because you're not going to school and your dad's like, well. If Sandy Koufax didn't pitch a World Series game on Yom Kippur, you're not doing any of that. And the funny thing is, is like, I'm a, of a certain age, but you talk to people across ages, and that's sort of that communal experience. Um, and so, because one of the greatest baseball players to ever live also foregrounded his Judaism in the mid 60s at a time where all of our cultures and our society, as we know it today, were really solidifying. I think that that's a really important moment for American Jews. But I also think that there's something about the architecture of baseball that really mimics the architecture of Judaism. So when you think about all of the traditions of baseball, all of the stories that we pass along, all of the arcane rules that sometimes like we want to be rid of, I, I, that's also, to me, Judaism, right? There are so many things that we take sort of this familial comfort in. And so when we pass down traditions, to me there's no other sport that's based in tradition and ritual in the way that baseball is. And so in a lot of ways it fundamentally aligns with how we sort of receive and live with Judaism. I think beyond the tradition, there's also the history. Uh, baseball's history is something that whether it's pre-1900, whether it's Dead Ball era, whether it's Babe Ruth, you have all of these characters who are just seminal to it and those stories get repeated. And what is Judaism if not a collection of stories that we can relate to in our lives right now and that even though they happened however many thousands of years ago in a desert far, far away with spiritual and mystical elements to it, the lessons taken from it still apply right now. And I think the lessons, and you guys can speak to this, the lessons you learn playing baseball will guide you the rest of your life. They will inform you. And I, I imagine like in the post-baseball world with your lives, you almost automatically tie things back to your experiences playing baseball and how you handle them. I think those were two of the most thoughtful answers to that question I've ever heard in my life. That was awesome. Luckily, uh, hear mine. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Uh, well, so from the thoughtful perspective, and I'll, I'll come in from the player side. Um, every team I played on, I was the token Jew. I was the only Jew on the team. And when you when you're in a in a clubhouse. That's just kind of how you talk to each other. You you kind of you hang out with your group of people. Everyone's together. It's a clubhouse. It's a it's a little micro culture inside of whatever world you're living in. So I think that's really cool. And then getting the opportunity to represent Israel and represent my Judaism and to play on the Israeli team was the first time in my life where oh my oh my gosh like this is two things that are part of my identity baseball. And, and my Judaism. And I get to merge these two things together. And so maybe there's not the thought of it, but it was just a baseball gave me the opportunity to do those two things and to combine them into one, which was really special for me. Um, going off of that point, I mean, I think, you know, as Jewish people, your back's always up, against the, always up against the wall. And as baseball players, you're going to fail more than you succeed. So that's one way that I've always tried to look at it. Like you're kind of, used to having your back against the wall, used to failure, and that's something that as a player and now later on in life, lessons that I always try to use and, and learn from. Um, for myself growing up, I always, like, again, mom always talked about Sandy Koufax, the, the same Yom Kippur analogies, um, but for me, I always liked Sean Green growing up, and now today, my favorite baseball player, without a doubt, is Shlomo Lippitz. I think he's a lot, lot of our favorite. So it's very nice to see this come full circle and see someone like Shlomo, one of the first people to leave Israel and play um, college ball in the United States, was um, you know incredible to be on the same field with somebody like that. Everybody talks about Sandy Koufax, but I'm, I'm the trivia guy, so I got some trivia here. It goes well beyond. So, well, well, before Sandy Koufax, Jews in baseball, the first professional baseball player 
was Jewish. Littman Pike, 1876. Cincinnati Red Sox, hey, you want me to play ball? You pay me $20 a week. That's a Jew. That's Jews in baseball. <laughs> And that's, I mean, it, it really starts there. But I, I, in all seriousness, I mean, that is true. Um, I, I think it, it goes, you know, I, I wonder if there's a, a group at a, a Knights of Columbus somewhere having an event called Italians in Baseball tonight. Because it, it comes down to the immigrant experience. Being, you know, coming through Ellis Island, come, you know, coming, coming over from the old world to the new world in the early 1900s. A lot of Jews look to assimilate. A lot of, a lot of immigrants in general. That's why they're all Italians playing ball. So... I think it comes down to basically that immigrant experience and the assimilation, and America being the national pastime, you know, was. I think a lot of, a lot of governments today are looking at basketball versus baseball, frankly. Baseball has sort of fallen off as the national pastime, unfortunately. But back then, it was baseball. And I think it was a way for, you know, kids to, to grow up and be a part of something that was beyond their very cloistered, perhaps more religious upbringing. And I, I think it applies to, to all the immigrant groups, frankly. Well, and I just wanted to add to that because I actually thought this was where Jeff was going. I think because of Field of Dreams, there's been sort of this ruralification. That's not a real word. I <laughs> rural drawer. <drawer. laughs> no one, no yes, one yes. watches 30, 30 Rock, Rock here. Okay, that's <laughs> fine. It's a room full of Jews that has never seen 30 Rock. Okay. <laughs> a lot of people think that baseball is this pastoral game, but the origins of baseball are actually in America's cities, right? You have a lot of immigrant communities that are playing in New York, right? It was an urban game, and that's where Jews lived. So, you know, not, even if not every Jew was going to become a professional baseball player, it was the sport they had most access to when they came here or when they were building their lives in America. So it wasn't just like this idea of America's pastime assimilation, although that's part of it. It was also part of the functional geography of where baseball was being played and where baseball players were coming from. Yeah. I mean, let's remember, Sandy chose baseball over basketball. He was an incredible basketball player, and I don't know if he would have been in the NBA, but certainly... So there's this great anecdote um, in Jane Levy's biography of him where... The Knicks were so bad at the time that he was in high school that the Knicks were doing this road show where they were scrimmaging against high schools. And so they scrimmaged against Sandy Koufax's high school uh, in Brooklyn. And he dropped like, I'm, I'm going to get the number wrong, but he dropped something insane, like 40 points against the New York Knicks. And basketball was his first love, and he was very good at it. But his best friend was Fred Wilpon. Right. And they played baseball together. And Fred Wilpon, despite being the ear of Mets Nation, actually plays a critical role in like Jews' connection and history with baseball. Yeah, Scott, so you mentioned New York, and New York obviously holds an important place in both Jewish history and baseball history. There was that period where there were three teams in New York at one time, and it's the cultural center of, of American Judaism. You are a resident Mets fan. Every franchise has their history yeah, and their yeah. period of suffering, but something about the Mets just feels Jewish. Don't hate the Marlins jersey, by the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm, this is called pandering for the locals here, okay? But I am a Mets. I am a Mets so fan. So why are the Mets so Jewish? Why are the Mets so Jewish? I mean, look, it's... Uh, Ike Davis. Uh, Ike Davis. <laughs> Art Shamsky. No, I think it also stems back, you know, the Mets, for those who don't know, entered the league in 1962, okay? The Dodgers and Giants left from Brooklyn after the 57 season. So there's a five-year gap there where there's the Yankees and that's it in New York. And the reason Mets are blue and orange is they borrow from the Dodgers and the Giants color. So they had this heritage. They're not in Brooklyn, they're in Queens, but being that team that sort of replaced the Brooklyn Dodgers closer than the Polo Ground. So geographically, they're sort of Brooklyn Queens replacement for the Dodgers, which was a very Jewish team. And I think it comes back to, you're talking about these kids playing stickball in Brooklyn. You know, so Koufax. But before Koufax, there was a, a guy named Cal Abrams, who was quite the ball player. Goody Rosen, Brooklyn Dodgers in the 30s and 40s. They had, you know, look, why were so many more Jews playing in the 30s and 40s? It was because uh, the same reason NYU was in the Final Four back then in CCNY. They did, the blacks and the Hispanics were not playing at that point. <laughs> so a lot more Jews were getting into the mix there. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but there was still, you know, there was still that, that feeling of it. Like the feeling of like, this, these are our guys, this is our team. And, and I think that, you know, Shamsky, you have a lot of the guys coming over from Duke Snyder, coming from the Dodgers to the Mets, Stengel, while well, he had his other affiliations. But no, it's, it's um, I think that's a big part of it, frankly. It's, it's the Brooklyn Dodgers connection. 
and we've obviously we've already brought up Sandy Koufax several times. So Meredith, I want to ask you because I I loved your episode on this. Why do we still start every baseball and Jewish conversation with him? And should we? No, not to take away from his accomplishments, of course, but oh, that was many so years ago, and there, we have all these other Jews. I mean, yeah, we got there are a few ways to think about this. Um, I mean, look, it is undeniable that Sandy Koufax is one of the greatest pitchers to ever pitch. Like, his mechanics were so far ahead of where pitchers were at the time that, like, he can he can still call Clayton Kershaw and give him mechanical advice on a pitch, and it can be contemporary, and, like, that's outrageous, and that's incredibly cool. But I also think, because part of the point of the show was to really explore American Jewish culture, that American Jews have evolved. I think it was very easy in the 1960s for every single American Jew to agree that what Sandy Koufax was doing was such an important representation of American Judaism. And that, you know, when, when Charlie Steiner was talking at the unveiling of the Sandy Koufax statue that was finally put in Dodger Stadium last summer, he talked uh, about Sandy sitting that game one, and he called it an act of civil disobedience. And at the time, in the 1960s, just the act of sitting was the political statement. And I think now that we live in 2023, one, American Jews are much more diverse. We have wide ranging political opinions. We have wide ranging views on what justice should look like, what representation should look like. And so Sandy Koufax was the right athlete at the right time when what he did mattered universally and could be agreed upon universally. Whereas when we look at Jewish athletes or even any athlete, today making a particular statement, I think it's harder to get universal agreement on what is a good representation. And I think we've been spending decades trying to find the next Sandy. And one of my theories is that we can't agree on what a Sandy Koufax looks like. Like to me, and this might be the episode you're referring to, like I think we should consider Sue Bird as like an heir apparent to Sandy Koufax. But there will be people who don't agree with that position. But also, like, what is aspirational Judaism? So I want to bring this up because we are here at the World Baseball Classic. Like, Jock Peterson is such an aspirational Jew to me. Like, I want to run a Burgundy Boys wine club in the clubhouse. I want to wear pearls because I feel like it's cool. I want every bubba at that stadium to be wearing fake pearls because I've made pearl wearing cool. I he Micah Johnson, who was a player who came up through the White Sox and then played at the Dodgers. He's now an artist, and he posted a thread the other day talking about who he owes in his career, and he talked about it being Jock Peterson because he'd never stepped into an art gallery until Jock Peterson took him to one in Los Angeles. And I just, like, I love his vibes and his energy, and when I think, like, oh, what kind of Jew am I or what I want to be, it's Jock Peterson. It's not necessarily Sandy Koufax. But again, I don't know that everyone would agree with that. It's it's heretical. My dad called me after the episode was done. He's like, I can't believe you said that. But I think it, it, that's sort of, it's a long answer and I'm going to stop talking because Jeff wants to say something. But it's a really interesting question that I think is hard to answer. Yeah, I just want to say I've met both of them and I'd rather be Sandy Koufax. Okay. I mean, <laughs> you're smarter than me. You'd like to be a Hall of Famer and I'd like to be drinking wine on a baseball field. Jock, so. Jock is a spectacular weirdo. Like in 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 a in the good ways. Like he's the guy who just walks into the clubhouse with a group of guys who he's never met before. Like he got traded to the Braves the year they won the World Series. His second day in the clubhouse, he sits the guys down and starts berating them about how the vibe in here sucks. And how about It did suck it, though. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I remember the night they won the World Series. I it was down like on the clubhouse level and it was still COVID protocol, so clubhouse was closed. So I would stand outside the door and when guys would walk out, I would walk with them to the bus and then I would walk back and just get waves of guys. And it shocked me that night as I was reporting how many guys pointed to Jock Peterson MFing everybody in the clubhouse <laughs> as the turning point of that season. And it, I mean, it can be done in different ways. Like Sandy Koufax, uh, you know, Sandy Koufax led teams with his elegance and with his gentlemanliness. Jock's not elegant or gentlemanly, but he's still effective nonetheless. Neither am I. <laughs> so you mentioned you've met both. You got to tell everyone here the, the Koufax story. Yeah, that was a huge humble brag. I'm not sorry at all. Um, 
So I was working on a, uh, a book called The Arm, and it was about Tommy John surgery, which if you're not familiar, there's a ligament in your elbow, and among pitchers, it breaks all the time, and I had set out to write the book about, okay, how does this epidemic that affects everyone from 10-year-old kids living in Japan to 40-year-old pitchers who are on their last leg, how, how do we stop this? And, and I was very hubristic in thinking that I was going to figure out something that these organizations that spend billions of dollars every year on pitchers still haven't figured out. But part of the journey in this whole process was talking with Sandy Koufax because, you know, the more research I did, the more I understood what Sandy Koufax put himself through to go out and pitch toward the end of his career. After one game, he threw his entire arm from upper biceps to right around his wrist was black and blue. It looked like the thing had gotten run over by a truck, but no, that was just the fact that he had a torn elbow ligament and he was pitching through it every third, you know, every fourth day as opposed to every fifth day as pitchers do now. And he didn't want to be the guy who didn't go out there and pitch. And yet, as many of us know, Sandy Koufax, I'm not going to call him a recluse by any means. He's just judicious with his time and doesn't have any for reporters, which is well within his rights and frankly, probably pretty intelligent. But thankfully, Jane Levy, who uh, Meredith referred to earlier, is a friend of mine and wrote the seminal biography of Sandy Koufax. And Jane called Sandy and said, hey, would you be willing to sit down with this kid who's doing a book on the pitching arm? And Sandy said yes. And I got a call uh, from a representative with the Dodgers who said, can you be in Arizona tomorrow to talk with Sandy? And five minutes later, uh, I had my flight booked. And I've never been more nervous for an interview. I called him Mr. Koufax. <laughs> like, the whole, it was just... I look back and there, there are multiple experiences in my career where I can point to and say that was so incredible. I don't think anything matches meeting and spending a half hour with Sandy Koufax. So <clears throat> Jonathan and Mitch, you guys played. There is this so-called Koufax curse. Did you ever come across a, a time where you had to make a decision to play or not play on a Jewish holiday or... You know, did you ever have those kind of those two parts of your identity competing? I'm sorry, I didn't think that's what you were talking about with the Kofax curse. I was worried that it was something else. No, no, no. There, there is a theory that Jews who play on the high holidays, especially, do worse. And there's another. You know, Meredith can share more because she talked to the guy who did the study, right? I talked. I, he's a law professor here. Yeah. Actually, well, not here in Miami, but somewhere in Florida. Basically, it's it's not statistically significant, but a lot of people who like to think that there is some sort of significance to playing or not playing. They tried to test the theory on whether players who decided to play in Yom Kippur did worse and if their teams lost. And anyway, there's no data to really support it, but they did go through the effort of trying to figure it out. So I think we're looking for anecdotal evidence here to try to prove that these guys were right. So I can go anecdotal here because the one thing that comes to mind, I wasn't even a player, but it was 2005, the White Sox, I was a White Sox fan, the White Sox were in the World Series, and the White Sox won the World Series that year. I think they went uh, they lost one, one game. game. Ele Eleven one? No, that doesn't make sense, does it? If whatever their record was, they lost one game. Pretty sure that game was on Yom Kippur. I don't, I don't think <laughs> I was, it I was, was, but we can check. It we can check. One, it was game one of the ALC. I was, I was, yeah, yeah, right. Against was the Ozzy Gee and a Jew? Ozzy Gee wasn't a Jew, but I couldn't be at the game. So ah, that's sorry. why I No, lost. but see, the curse would have been had you gone to the game and they lost. I know, but I was... I see. Yeah, right, right. Okay. But, so. the, the answer is I don't know that there's a curse. So maybe it's the opposite. So maybe it's disproving the Okay, curse. so if you were on the White Sox and they were playing in the World Series on Yom Kippur, would you have played? I would have to be in that situation to make the decision. <laughs> that's a great, great... Dodge the question. So that's a yes. I, I think I am... I just learned that I'm a victim of the Koufax curse um, because definitely my whole life growing up as... As that time of year came around, it was, you know, conversations with mom about what is going to happen on this day. And, you know, it was the argument of wanting to play baseball and wanting to hang out with my friends and not go to synagogue. And to make a long story short, um, before playing with Team Israel, I had five arm surgeries. 
And now I learn that that is a result of maybe not improper training or preparation. It's just being a victim of the Koufax curse. <laughs> Thank you for bringing this up. <laughs> and so to John's point, in, in uh, anything in performance, if there's one ounce of doubt in anything you do, so shoot, should I be playing today? It's, it's Yom Kippur. It would in fact in, impact your performance. So I would say it's a real thing. Talk about the next Sandy Koufax. Is anybody familiar with Jacob Steinmetz? Yeah. Yes. Okay. This kid could be the next Sandy Koufax. If you don't know, Jacob Steinmetz, third round pick, Arizona Diamondbacks, pretty high round pick in 2021. Orthodox Jew. First Orthodox Jew drafted into Major He's League the baseball. first Orthodox first Jew. Known Orthodox Jew. Right. Jewish. The most Jewish baseball player in the history of the game. I think we can agree. This guy is so Jewish, his chin music is klezmer. This guy, this guy is so Jewish. He's got two pitching rubbers and one meat and one dairy. He can't mix up his, he can't mix the cheddar with the sliders. These are all beef sliders. Steinmetz, the name Mets. He's that's what you like. Mets, the most Jewish baseball team. It's and a his, Jewish name. And his father Elliot is the basketball coach at Yeshiva University. There, so you, go. there you go. No, this guy's good. He does a shechting on before every payoff pitch. I like that you worked this in just so you could rehearse the jokes yeah. you've been working. Yeah. On. I think it's killing in the room. Interesting right? thing. Interesting thing about Steinmetz. Batters who face him can walk on three pitches. Yeah. You think he's paying full count? <laughs> he got him down to three, to three balls. All right. We're going to reel it back in. <laughs> so, I want, well, I, Scott, I wanted to ask you. you are Moving the, on. You're the, well, one last Kofax question. We're going to move on. You are from New York. You made the move to L.A., like someone else we know, Mr. Koufax. Yeah. If you could ask him any questions, since you have not had the chance, like most of us in the world, to talk to him, what, what would you ask him? It's very simple. Would you sign my 1989 Hall of Fame program, which I have signed by every living Hall of Famer who was alive in 1989, except for Sandy Koufax and Willie Mays, which really is killing me. As OCD, this is killing me. I got to get him to sign the yearbook. So that's what I would ask him, primarily. Okay, so but, but if you want a baseball question, honestly, I want to, so, you know, I want to know how much he knew because we were talking about, you know, you brought up the fact that Sandy Koufax is the seminal Jew that we all talk about, but as a young Jew himself, there was no Sandy Koufax that he can think of, or was it a Hank Greenberg for him? Greenberg. Right. So I, I want to know how much, like, a Hank Greenberg influenced him, um, you know, Al, Ro well, Al Rosen came a little, a little earlier, but I just, I, I'm curious about how, you know, a young Jewish Sandy Koufax growing up, what did he think of Jewish ballplayers? a good segue to our next question. So there is Sandy Koufax, but there are many other Jews who have played baseball. There are about 20 almost in this coming season. So I'm curious, as fans and as reporters for the two of you, how, often, how much do you pay attention to the Jews? Like, do you, you know, Jews on lists can be a little tricky sometimes, but do you pay attention to the Jews? Do you track them? Do you, you know, how much do you care about the Jewish players specifically? And any of you as fans or, or not? I would say I track the ones because I played with them. <laughs> but, uh, not not so much. I think I think maybe I don't want to speak for for John, but being growing up, I don't think I really uh, except for Sean Green. So that's really the only Jewish MLB player that I really knew. I think growing up that I really tracked, um, but that was it. And so then once you start playing, and uh, you kind of lose your fanship a little bit because it's your job. You're pl you're playing at the same time the big leaguers are playing. So you kind of lose that fanship, but uh, I think that was the great thing about the creation of, of, of Team Israel and the WBC is it creates this awareness. So I think it's, an, it's hopefully a, a new thing that'll continue to grow. Yeah. And to Mitch's point, I think one of the most interesting parts of being a part of Team Israel is, like you said before, we're the only ones in almost every locker room we've ever been in. And then you join Team Israel for the first time and you're actually a part of a team where you have something in common with everybody there and i will say to that to that point I, I went to the exhibition game last night and it was incredible to see all these guys that you know we've been following so closely over the last few years that are now you know friends more than just teammates and i mean those are guys that i follow more than anybody else today yeah that's good let's let's dig into team israel because that is why we're here in miami so i want to hear about your experience but let's talk about the current team first so Jeff, I want to put you on the spot. Can you give us a quick scouting report of this team? We talked about Jock, but like, who are the people we should know? Who are the sleepers? What does this team look like? I don't know that Dean Kramer is the best Jewish pitcher since Sandy Koufax, but he's got to be right up there, right? Like, you guys, I mean, Dean Shlomo. Kramer. I mean, aside, well, 
Jason Marquis up there, maybe? Yeah, I think Dean probably is going to... Uh, you know what? Jason Marquis had a long career, so that's uh, that may be tough to get to. I think Dean may have the best stuff of anyone. Certainly, I got a text from a scout last night, actually. Honest to God, this is a true story. He said, do you know Shlomo Lippitz is still pitching? Is he older than you? And I looked it up, and in fact, at 44 years old, Shlomo Lippitz was still older than me. I mean, in fairness to Team Israel, isn't Adam Wainwright on Team USA, and he also might be your age? I don't think Adam Wainwright threw a ball 65 miles per hour last night. Shlomo Lippitz <laughs> did. <laughs> yes, he did. He, the, the scout said to me, you know, he has a very low effort delivery. <laughs> so they're going to sign him. That's exactly, that's exactly right. So Dean Kramer is the ace of the staff. Uh, he's excellent. They're, the number, I think, you know, Jock wasn't in the lineup last night, right? He, okay. He's joining the team this weekend. Okay, Matt Mervis hit third last night. He could be the first baseman for the Chicago Cubs by the end of the 2023 season. Uh, undrafted in 2020 when there was only a five-round draft mm -hmm. and uh, got signed by the Cubs and has just been a breakout prospect for them is among their top five prospects and they have a very good farm system. So you've got him, you've got Zach Geloff. Um, the, you know, the pitching staff isn't deep, but there are some relievers there who, like, it's a representative team. I don't know that they're going to make the run that the 17 team did, it's a little more difficult to get out of this Miami bracket, maybe, than last time. If you're not familiar with this bracket, uh, the Dominican Republic team uh, is the best team in the tournament, talent-wise. Uh, are people calling it like the the best baseball team in history? Team USA Dream yeah. Team in yeah. basketball. I mean, they're baseball. they're that good. Venezuela is a baseball hotbed that in recent years has lost a little bit of luster just due to the political instability down there, and so they don't get scouted quite as much, but you still see stars up and down that lineup. Puerto Rico, another fantastic team. Like, I mean, I don't know how to equate Israel making it out of this bracket. Would this be like the miracle on grass? <laughs> like, I, I mean, it would... It, I'm sorry to be like... Debbie Downer here. It's not going to happen. But it's going to be fun watching them get to play. Hey, the, the Dutch did it. Yeah. The Dutch beat DR. That, you know 2009. what? 2009. I, I've been doing this for, tw I've covered baseball for 20 years now. And honestly, I should know by now not to, no, seriously. That That's the beauty of baseball. You look, I understand that, you know, the difference between the Korean team and the Australian team that played last night, the KBO, the Korean Baseball Organization, um, it, it is considered a much higher league that's played during the summer compared to the Australian Baseball League, which is a winter league. And the Aussies were, I mean, it's just a bunch of guys who hold second jobs now, and Australia went out and beat Korea last night. And they have a really good chance to advance out of that bracket now. And so the notion that Israel could beat the DR, yeah, it's possible. It's possible because it's baseball and it doesn't take some sort of miraculous thing it just takes the right team on the right day so i want to ask you this though what were the odds of team israel making it making it to the olympics fair enough god does well, wonderful odds. things sometimes <laughs> moses getting out of the desert i mean what do we you know <laughs> <laughs> we, we did only we did qualify through the the Europe Africa qualifier, which is a little easier than the Latin American. I shouldn't have said that. Really. Uh, but but at the, at the same time, to, to Jeff's point, this is also tournament baseball. So and I, and Israel has a real reason to beat Nicaragua in the in the game on Sunday um, because it allows them to automatically qualify for the future for the next WBC uh, without having to go through a qualifier. So uh, it, there's there's strategy involved in what games are you going to throw your best talent, what games, and so the same on the other side. So anything can happen in a nine-inning game. You need a little, you need some, you need some timely hitting. You need good pitching, good defense. It's like any other baseball game, uh, but it's only nine innings. So, uh, but. I, I can't say I disagree with Jeff. And every game is game seven, and anything can happen in game seven, for sure. So Jonathan and Mitch, you both played for Team Israel in the Olympics. You mentioned a little bit what it meant to you, but I want to dig in deeper what that meant to wear Israel on your chest, especially on the world stage. Yeah, um, yeah, I can. happy to start here. Um, you know, growing up Jewish, I'm from, like I said, northern Westchester County, where Westchester County has a lot of Jews, but where I grew up, there were not many. Um, so I will say the first, we were talking about this before, um, Mitch and I showed up, you know, four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning in Bulgaria, day before our first game, and 
I had had no idea what to expect, didn't know a lot of the guys, and you show up, and it was immediately the most welcoming, friendly, want to get to know everything about you group of people that I've ever been a part of. And I don't know how much of a correlation to success there is, um, but I feel like in that situation, I never felt so confident, comfortable, you know, in my own element on the mound, knowing that, you know, there's people in the dugout, there's people in the stands here supporting us, but there's millions of people at home that, you know, this means just as much as it does to you, if not more. And to know that you have such an amazing group of people following you all around the world was something that, you know, Mitch, I think you can speak to this as well as something that we're all so proud of. Yeah, I I think wearing Israel across my chest, uh, it, and it really was, it wasn't about the name on the back, which is kind of a cliche in sports. You know, play for the name on the front of your jersey, not the back of the jersey. I had never felt that more truly than wearing the Israel uniform. And But it's, it goes, for me, it goes deeper. Like uh, John said, he grew up Jewish. Uh, it's something like deeper to my family also. Like my grandpa said the three things he loves the most in the world are family, Israel, baseball. Like those are the three things he loved most in the world. Um, and so, sure, there's the element of like making my family proud and getting to combine like what I said earlier about combining those aspects of my identity. But uh, there was also this aspect playing for Team Israel. I'd never seen teams consistently overperform. We always played better than we were supposed to play. We always outperformed what we looked like on paper. Uh, we may have gotten three hits in a game. But those three hits were when there was runners on second and third base with two outs every single time. And it just happened over and over. So everyone in this room knows what Bashert means. And, and it, it just felt like that every single I get the goosebumps thinking about it because we say, oh, man, I really wish Simon Rosenbaum would hit it. We were playing the Russians in Bulgaria. And it was in the eighth inning, and we were down by three. And so that could have been the end to this whole story. And Simon Rosenbaum, who was... The, in analytics for the for the Rays, he hits a three run opposite field three run homer, and all of a sudden we're, we're tied with the Russians and we beat him in extra innings. So all these little things just happen, and and that's just one example, and it it goes on. So um, there's something eerie about it, and it goes all the way to playing in Germany against the Germans and uh, the national team. And I remember uh, I think my cousin may have actually been at that game, and and uh, uh, and I remember. After the game, my dad asked, "Like, did you feel like the the you know like the Germans versus the Israelis? Like, are are you, or did you feel?" It? And it's like, like for us, and and you pitched in that game, um, you came in in the ninth inning. Um, I think I made an error when he was, or no, I, he got a double play ball, and I I, I booted it. Um, that that added to the injuries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the five <laughs> the five extra pitches. <laughs> But you got the next one was the ground ball right after, and then I turned it over after that. So the second uh, worst thing that happened to Jews in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so, do you do you feel that when you were playing? Like, no, we're just playing a game. Um, but the there's there was something special about wearing that uniform and just amazing things happening. I I've spent a long time trying to quantify chemistry. And and. I just don't think it's possible to do that. I think it's a a very you know it when you feel it sort of thing. And think about when you walk into a room of Jews. We just feel something different. There's the shared experience. There's the knowledge that we can say some stupid joke and that we can all go properly. And that there, there's that there's just that thing about being around other Jews. And imagine I. You know, I've I've never gone out aside from like pick up basketball at the JCC on Saturday morning and known this. But imagine like going to an international event where you're with a bunch of Jews and you're going out and competing. That seems incredible. And if ever there were a reason for the inexplicable to happen, I think that's attributable to chemistry among a team. And I'm not saying that Simon Rosenbaum hit an opposite field three-run home run because of chemistry. What I am saying for certain is that when Simon Rosenbaum went up to the plate that day, I bet he felt a lot more comfortable with who was surrounding him than he ever did at any other point in his career. And I think that comfort allows you to, it, ta it just takes away one other thing in your head when you're competing, it's already tough enough to be a high-level professional athlete. 
if you can erase one little mind block or one little thing that's going to prevent you from performing at your best, it's a huge thing. That one little thing could make all the difference in your performance. Um, I think one thing, you know, going off of that point, um, uh, I remember when we were playing in Germany and Danny Valencia had joined the team for the first time. Um, and, you know, growing up, he was somebody that I remember watching play. Um, and Danny said something like, I had never in my baseball career, I, I don't think he had much playoff experience. He said he had never been in a situation where he wanted to win so bad. And there we are on some back, back end field of somewhere in Germany um, where they're doing, dragging the field two minutes before the game. And to hear something like that from someone who has you know, such an amazing big league career, um, it just, again, just added to that level of chemistry. And not to mention, we were losing, I think, by three or four runs to Sweden in the last inning, facing going into the loser's bracket. And sure enough, five infield singles later, a total of 50 feet, uh, we somehow put up three or four runs and won the game. So we talk about camaraderie, and I think part of what makes Team Israel unique, and maybe some of you don't know this, is for the WBC, you don't have to be a citizen of the country you're playing for. You just have to be eligible to be a citizen, which means if you are in this room and you are Jewish, you're eligible for Team Israel. And so I think that's part of what draws fans to it. It's like it, you're watching the team, and it's like guys you grew up with at summer camp. And I'm curious, for those of us on the stage who didn't play, what was it like watching Team Israel, and did you feel that kind of connection when you were watching the games or covering the games? not cover the games. Um, look, I think that this goes back to one of the questions you were asking earlier about like, is it meaningful or do you follow Jewish athletes? Uh, one, my first thought was that you didn't grow up with a dad in the 90s at like the advent of the internet who every time he heard a name that sounded remotely Jewish yelled at you to go look it up on juhu.com. That hasn't ended uh, since the 90s. Just yeah, like. it's not. It's like big Jewish geography. Um, yeah. There are a lot of there's a lot of subtext that's been happening here that I've wanting to have been wanting to ask questions about, particularly because like baseball isn't just like not a Jewish sport. It's not like an agnostic sport. I think in a lot of ways it's like a really Christian sport. A lot of these clubhouses are really dominated by people who believe like devoutly in Christianity. And I do wonder like how that impacts like how you feel in a clubhouse. Um, but beside that, into your initial question. I think even in the past few years, it's become a little bit more fraught to be Jewish in America. And um, being able to see like Jewish athletes play and succeed and have joy is really important. It's also just a, as you mentioned, like a particular dynamic because it's mostly American Jews playing for Israel. And I think we could have an entire panel on like the difference between what it means to be American Jew and what it means to be Israeli and all of the politics that are embedded in that. But I think having the opportunity for a growing number of Jewish players to come together and play, I think it's, it's cool and it's meaningful for people to be able to see. Um, I mentioned this in the podcast a lot, but a lot of my thinking is shaped by the fact that I have a two-year-old. Uh, we've committed to raising him Jewish and a Braves fan, which is not my uh, team that I grew up with, but I think about him being able to like Hopefully Max Fried is still with the Braves when he's old enough to really receive baseball. But like the idea that like one of the best players on the Braves is Jewish is cool. Like my view on sports, it's almost like I'm a Mets fan. I think that sports is a lifetime of suffering. So I knew the second I committed to raising a Braves fan that they would win a World Series when he was one, and it might be the only World Series of his life. But the idea that there, you know, that there are two Jews who figured prominently in that team it is really cool, and I want him to have opportunities to be proud of Jewish athletes and to have those sorts of figures in the world. So whether it's having a world baseball classic team or thinking about or seeing Jewish athletes who are succeeding, I think that that is meaningful because the other part is for people who aren't Jewish, right? It normalizes seeing Jewish people succeeding in a context like baseball that people really feel connected to and revere in some way. So I don't know if that answered your question really directly, but I, I do think that it's significant and it's fun to watch people have fun playing baseball. Like it's really miserable to watch people being miserable. So if you have a dynamic where people are having a good time, like that's fun to watch and that's fun to see and have modeled and to like be a stakeholder in the World Baseball Classic in a way that people thought Jews wouldn't be. Yeah, I, I mean, look, it, it's, 
it's something innate, I think, to to every group, right? Jews, we want to see our own represented. I mean, I have the book in our, our family, Great Jews in Sports, Richard Slater, you know, or Rob, Robert Slater. And my mom actually photocopied pages of this book and mailed it to me to, of the baseball players to prepare for tonight. Thank you, mom, again. <laughs> but, but, you know, these, these are the things we grew up with. And it's not just baseball or sports. It's 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 music. It's knowing Paul Abdul is Jewish. How cool is that? You know, it, or, or 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 celebrities in any field. And it's just it's just the fact that we can see of ourselves make it there, making it to the major leagues, making it to Team Israel. That's pretty damn impressive. I mean, making it to this this prestigious team. One of twenty teams. Exactly. Or just even getting drafted. I mean, I get excited for Scott Schoenweiss. Okay, like I don't care how big of a player you are. Sam Fold. Yes. You know, Adam a Greenberg. White Sox pitcher is getting name dropped. This. Yeah. Show. But I mean, in, truly, it, it's it's uh, something that yeah, you want to see your, yourself represented out there, making it and making us all proud. Shep and Nachas, each and every one of them. I just want to say for the record, Max Fried is better than Dean Kramer. Yeah, yeah. But Sorry, he's not, but he's not on the roster. Yeah, but, no. yeah. But I was yeah, what's that about? Also, like I love when they do like, and I we watched a few of the Apple TV Plus broadcasts. You don't have to comment on the quality of them, but they had. They, w- they would always do the side-by-side side of, like, Max Fried and Sandy Koufax. They'd be like, both lefties, both, like, L.A. connected. And you're like, they're also Jewish. Yeah. Like, we get it. Both he wears, a cancer's deli. He wore 32 growing up, Max Fried, because Sandy Koufax was his idol. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about, we're talking about camaraderie, and I'm curious for Jeff uh, and Meredith, as reporters, do you feel that same kind of connection when you come across other Jewish reporters? Because especially in baseball, there are many of us. But even you know, in political reporting all over, do you feel that kind of connection in the press box? I don't really feel much of a connection because pretty much all of us are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm only slightly exaggerating. I told, I told Jake this in a, uh, in a conversation that we had had. There was one point during the World Series where I believe there were eight Jewish male reporters in the same row right next to one another. And I think it was Danny Nobler who just looked at us and said, we almost got a minion. Like, (laughs) I mean, it was Ken Rosenthal, John Heyman, Danny. um, There were, there were a few others in there, but you know, um, Joel Sherman was one of them. And Joel is, Joel is always, uh, uh, boisterous in in the press box, and so uh, if it is a holiday, then Joel will let us know, and and you know we'll discuss who fasted, who didn't. Like Judaism doesn't come up a whole lot inside the press box necessarily, but it's almost like you just know, and all of us have had that feeling before. If we've met a stranger, and like you know. Do I know your face from somewhere? No. Have I heard your name before? No. What's the familiar? Oh, you're Jewish. Of course. <laughs> like, we just have that that thing and that is omnipresent, I think, among the media, perpetuating stereotypes in a manner that Scott has been doing all night. So thank you for that. <laughs> One of my running jokes, so um, I was the sports editor of the 103rd volume of my college newspaper, and pretty much I was the first female who was elected to that position. And I used to joke that it was a big stretch. Instead of a Jewish boy from New York or New Jersey, they chose a Jewish girl from Chicago. And that was like a big reach for them. So I think that there's always sort of been this really strong presence, particularly in sports media, of Jewish reporters. And I don't know if it's- But it's the, like, it's the newspaper people mostly. Like yeah. all of us came from the print background. Like the, yeah, yeah. the Goyam run the TV side. Like- <laughs> Yeah, I-, I mean, <laughs> I think there's, it, there's not a lot of faces for TV. <laughs> it's true. He says with the hair with TV though, you've got you've got TV hair, Jeff. The only reason I grew my hair out is because my child looked at me one day and said, "Dad, you have old hair." And let me tell you, when your child says you have old hair, nothing cuts so deep. And so, yes, this. I was... think. Look, I think that uh, Jews are really good storytellers. I think. Um, when you think about like being a baseball beat reporter and having to cover 162 games a year, you have to like be self-loathing. Yeah, a hundred percent. You have to be self-loathing and masochistic and like a glutton for punishment in a way that Jews are like just prepared for. for. I like the the baseball season. I mean, you guys know this. The baseball season 
of all the sports out there is the most unrelenting. And it's unrelenting not just because you have the six weeks of spring training, the six months of the season, but, I mean, you started throwing again, you gave yourself two to four weeks off after the season, and then you just kept going, I assume? Less these days, it's no days off. Yeah, There's no, I mean, no off season. No. Yeah, it's, it's just a, it, it is a relentless sort of industry, and uh, I, don't know, I don't know if this is necessarily the, the quality that Jews share, but I think there is in many ways a relentlessness about us. Like, we, we do not give up, and we continue going on, and we work, and we work, and we work to better ourselves, better our families, uh, you know, better the community. And also, there's something, because we're talking a lot about American Judaism, mm -hmm. and, and baseball, and the connection there, that's why we're here, and, and in order to play on the national team, we had to get our Israeli citizenship, get our dual citizenship, but, so, to to the idea of being relentless, and it, just hearing Hatikva before you play in a game, there's it's it's a different it, it hits differently, and uh, and so it goes back to the camaraderie, and it goes back to why are you playing so hard? It goes back to thinking about things you're grateful for before you play, because you're thinking about your family, because there's something that's deeper to your root that ties to you. So uh, I I think that's all connected, absolutely, on the playing side too. That was my next question. So for the WBC, you don't have to be an Israeli, but for the Olympics, you did. So I'm curious for the two of you what that experience was like gaining that citizenship. And now that you're not on the team anymore, you're still technically an Israeli-American. What does that mean to you now? Again, I think it all goes back to that identity that we all have created together. Um, it's something where, you know, being Jewish, whether or not you grew up with Jewish friends, um, now it's not just your teammates. It's not just your the people that I went to Hebrew school with. Now it's everybody in Israel is, if they're aware that this is happening, they're, they're there supporting you. And um, I had never been to Israel, never, never did birthright or any, had an opportunity to travel there um, up until I got my citizenship. And I think similar feeling to what we just referenced with Hatikva, um, first time I heard that during a game, like had never felt my heart race through my chest in that, in that sort of manner before. Um, and I think we were playing somewhere where the anthem cut out and we all had, we on the sidelines, it was somewhere in Europe, we all collectively together just carried on and started singing the anthem as a team. And that again was one of those feelings that was so beautiful. And, you know, going to, going to the Wailing Wall for the first time, again, like putting your hand there, putting your own personal note in the wall was very similar to that, you know, adrenaline rush. Um, Something that I'll never forget. Yeah, I, th I think it's also interesting that we were talking about this earlier before that e each player has a different relationship to their Judaism. They have a, and you don't have to be Jewish to be on the team as well. I mean, uh, there's, and I think that's a point that a lot of the Sabras, the Israeli born players make is, is to, they have a different relationship. It doesn't necessarily have to be a Jewish team, but to the Americans that made. Aliyah, the Americans that got Israeli citizenship, our Jewishness was a big part of it. It was the part of it. So to us, it's a little different than the Israeli-born players, maybe. Um, at, at the same time, though, everyone has a different relationship to Judaism, a different relationship to Israel, and how you grew up. I grew. I went to a Jewish day school growing up, so being aware of Israeli culture and, and my, my Jewishness, I was always aware of it, and it's just also family, where there's guys in the team that maybe didn't have a bar, bar mitzvah, um, so we, we joke because I think we were on the back of the bus. This was the 2017, uh, or is 2016 the qualifier? And I think it was it was probably Cody Decker was talking about. Oh, we should give each other J scores, and so you know you get a certain amount of points for if you had a bar mitzvah. This is so Jewish. Yeah, yeah like yeah. just gatekeeping <laughs> and trying to figure out who the most let's Jewish. Right. Let's bring a, yeah. let's bring accounting into this. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely, and Steinmetz would crush it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he would. Yeah, he'd win. But and of course, Cody was the one who came up with oh, this too. The cool, least yeah. Jewish one. Yeah, <laughs> but the one who brought Mench on the bench to the team, right? Mench on the bench. Yeah, a certain amount of chest hair gave you amount of points you'd get. Uh, you know, so yeah, just, can we go over the categories, yeah, yeah. please? <laughs> like all of them. That's the next panel. Yeah. The next <laughs> that's great. That's great. So we're we only have a few more minutes. We're going to wrap up with some questions from our audience here, and one of them is about Israel and Israel baseball actual baseball in actual Israel. What does it look like right now to your guys' knowledge? I know Mitch, this is important to you, and I'm curious how the WBC, if it has, and how it has helped raise that profile for the sport. 
Yeah, I think it's uh, – and I think anyone here that's, in, that's interested in getting involved in baseball in Israel, there's absolutely an opportunity right now because there's fields that are, uh, that are being built right now. One field just was finished. There's a field being in Beit Shemesh. There's a field in Renana. So, uh, and a lot of these fields are being played on with the baseball um, by families that had made Aliyah. And so it, it, we were talking about how the, the Jews or the immigrants that came to the U.S., they had baseballs, what they found. Well, now it's kind of happening in the opposite way, where the, the, the Americans that make Aliyah, now they're the ones that are involved in baseball in Israel. But uh, we need to keep growing the game, and that's been the goal of, of playing and creating the European Championship team, um, the Israeli League. But there's a need for more coaches, so absolutely there's a need to grow the game from the grassroots level. There needs to be a T-ball league, so that can feed into what we know here today uh, going forward. So they're absolutely... Uh, we want the game to grow more than it is right now because the, we're, it's an uphill battle. Um, but I think the Olympics, the World Baseball Classic, it absolutely adds a dimension and gives a goal to these kids in Israel that can, they can watch and say, okay, this is what I'm striving for. So it's always important to have that. Where does playing, even if it's just a pipe dream, what could it be at the end? And you look at someone like Alon Leichman as a success story here. Grew up in Israel playing baseball in the kibbutz. Now he's the assistant pitching coach with Cincinnati Reds. And he played on Team Israel with us. So, um, and we have the WBC, but it is also spring training. Opening day is March 30th. So zooming out to Jews in baseball in general, not just Team Israel, what are you looking forward to this season? There are so many players. We had, I think, 16 last year, and there will probably be more this year because of guys like Matt Mervis and Zach Geloff who are coming up the minors. So... Why are there so many Jews in baseball right now, and, and what gets you excited about this season? This could be for any of you. I really thought you were saying, what do you get excited about this year? I was like, Shohei Otani, I wonder if he's Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could convert him. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. Um, Mervis's debut, Ma uh, Max Fried is one of the best pitchers in the world, and he's going to be a free agent not after this season, but after yeah, next season. The arbitration mess this summer. It, I feel like the Braves are not inviting him really to want to come It's back. a very... See, here's the thing. Maybe this is just more exciting and intriguing to me because a lot of my job these days is transactions and contracts and trades and You're stuff like that. trying to become like the that. baseball loach. Uh, sure. I don't know about trying, I think. Yeah, yeah like there, probably. Uh, I don't know about that. Rosenthal, another Jew, you know? Put the two of us together, it would be like a Voltron of Jew to Jewish baseball reporting. It would be great. Um, but Max Fried, I don't think he's going to get traded because he's the best pitcher on Atlanta. But the notion of seeing him after the 2024 season, perhaps in a different uniform, Los Angeles was mentioned earlier, I think that's certainly a possibility. So I, I don't know, maybe I'm just, maybe I gravitate toward the, the high achievers when in reality I should be looking like, is Zach Eloff not like the perfect embodiment of the Jewish ball player? How tall is he? Like, he might be the shortest person on stage today. And like, I think I am now and I'm 5'9". So uh, the fact that without all of the tools that you see necessary, almost necessary to make it to the big league these days, he's there, I, I think is a testament to uh, to to that effort, that ability, and those secondary skills beyond just power or speed, uh, but determination and going through rep after rep, knowing that you have to be as good as you can possibly be if you want to make it to that level. I got my eyes on Spencer Horowitz. You know about this kid? I saw him in spring training. I, Double A, I, Honest Toronto. to God, I hadn't heard of him before, and I looked up on the score, and I'm like, there's a Jew. There's a Jew, exactly. And that's, <laughs> and that's what I love about him, because he's got that Jewish name. Yes. I mean, there's some sneaky, Rowdy Tellez. He's Jewish. Go figure. But Spencer Horowitz, that's a throwback to the Maury Arnoviches, okay? The Mo Drabowskis. We need the, not just Jewish baseball players, but Jews who sound and, and like they're Jewish. Your mom sent you a lot of pages, oh, yeah. didn't she? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Big Ed Ruleback pitched back-to-back -back shutouts at a doubleheader. Jewish. And Spencer is playing for Team Israel. And yes. Last night at the game in the press box, Jay Horwitz, who you might know, Mets legend. That's PR. He is helping Team Israel with PR, and he turned to the other people in the press box and said, that's my son. <laughs> it's not his son. <laughs> of course, everybody believed him. Horowitz. Um, any final words before we wrap up? What you're looking forward to this season, Jews in baseball representation? I mean, I think we covered it. 
cover day. You did a wonderful job. Uh, thank you. Jacob Steinmetz, this guy's so Jewish. <laughs> How Jewish? He Brought shakes off signs with a lulav. <laughs> <laughs> this guy... This guy's so Jewish. I think. Finish him. You, forget, forget not pitching on Yom Kippur. This guy won't pitch on Lagba Omer. I think before the JCC never welcomes us back, that's a great place to end. <laughs> Thank you, all of you, so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank all of you. You did a great job. Thank you very much. Jacob, we are now going to we ha hopefully take out your raffle tickets. Here's how we're going to do this. We have, we have two sets of tickets. There's five total. So the first thing uh, raffle that we're going to pull is for two tickets. All of these are for Sunday's game against Nicaragua. I think it's 12-15. Team Israel. Actually, you know what? Why don't you pull the ticket for him? We got ticket number six four five seven two two. Did you really win? Do you want to put it back in? He's already going to the game. <laughs> Another one. Is anybody not going to the game? Six four five seven two three. Seven two three. That was the next ticket. Is it yours? Are you kidding? All right, we'll keep trying here. This is a Jewish raffle. <laughs> Six four five seven zero oh, two. All right, you already have tickets. Oh, you're good. Now I'm you do. Six four five seven zero four. Seven zero four. Which game? Sunday. Sure. All right. <laughs> if you insist. Good. Great. Thank you, everybody. It was a wonderful time. Thank you, each of the panelists. You wonderful uh, conversation, and we love our baseball and we love our Jewish heritage. So thank you for being here. <laughs>